Good morning. Welcome to Family Sunday here at Shepherd's Grove. Yes, welcome, welcome, church family. We are so thrilled to have you here. We hope you leave here refreshed, restored, with new vision for your life, for your family's life. And uh, Cohen, do you want to say anything? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Haven, hey, do you want to pray for us as we open the service today? Dear Jesus, I pray that, um, not, that everybody here will be refreshed and happy today. I pray that my dad's birthday will be great. <laughs> and I pray that, everybody, that nothing's bad today or anything like that. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord found in Matthew. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began sinking, crying out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. We are believing we can be more and releasing our faith. Amen. Draw
Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we pray for big and bold faith like that of Peter, that we can step out of the boat and walk on water with you. Lord, we pray that even in the midst of our fears and the winds of life, that we do not sink. But when we feel as though we are sinking and we cry out to you, you are there. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together and worship you and bless your name. Father, we pray for all of those in our congregation who are uh, under tremendous pressure, who are sick, maybe with health concerns or relational issues. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for community to surround them and your healing touch to be present with them. Lord, there's also so many within our congregation who are celebrating good news a job promotion, new relationships, fresh beginnings. Lord, we delight in those things. We rejoice, we celebrate, and we thank you for those great things in our life. Lord, there are other times where we simply do not know what to pray. So we look to the words of Scripture, how Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, the far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake 
make my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What though the tempest round me rears, I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble, sick with fear, and hear the Rejoice both far and near. How can I keep from singing? In a prison cell and a dungeon vile, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? No storm can Join me in prayer. Gracious God, Lord of all nations, we pause to reflect upon our blessings as a nation and the high cost of those blessings. We offer our prayers of thanks and intercession. Thank you for the freedom we enjoy in this country, for opportunities to flourish, and for the security of our land. Guide those who lead our nation in international affairs. Help them to pursue diplomatic paths that prevent needless conflict. May they have your wisdom about when and how to use the military you have entrusted to us. God of peace, stir in the hearts of the leaders of all nations and in all who would use violence to further their cause. Change their hearts and minds. Give them a passion for peace. Bring an end to pain, an end to suffering, an end to injustice, and an end to violence in our world. We know, Lord, that ultimate peace will not come until your kingdom is here in all of its fullness. Nevertheless, we pray for a foretaste of the future. We ask for the growth of peace throughout our world today so that fewer and fewer men and women will have to risk and even to sacrifice their lives. We long for the day when people will, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. May your kingdom come, Lord, and your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. All praise be to you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of justice, God of peace, King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am. Amen. Hi friends, here at Shepherd's Grove in Hour of Power, we are passionate about sharing God's love and dignity with the people in our community, both here in Orange County and all over the world. And we consider you an important part of that community. So today, I hope you'll consider joining our mailing list so we can better encourage you and connect with you. To join our mailing list, please call, write, or go online today. To thank you for joining, we'll send a special bookmark featuring the Creed of the Beloved. We hope it reminds you of how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. Please call, write, or go online today. Hi friends, we are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. Yes, everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day -day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles, and an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are, and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. 
I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six-pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby. We hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we. Welcome, we're so glad you're watching today. You are a part of our church. Wherever you are, whatever country you're in, we want you to know that we love you from the other side of the world, or if you live in like, I don't know, Buena Park, we still love you, even though you're not that far. We're, 
And if you're close, come down to Shepherd's Grove. We want to meet you. If you're close to Disneyland, you're close to us. And we'd love to see you here sometime. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving all that's good from the Lord? And say this with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. I want to talk today mainly about one of my favorite Bible characters, Peter, and how Peter showed us that any schlub can become an awesome man of God. I want you to leave here believing you can, you can be more. And that's not to say that you're not enough. The Lord loves you. He's proud of you. you you're doing a lot better than you think. But you can be even more. You can experience even more that your life is not limited in the ways that you think it is. And I know if you're a human being, you've said to yourself many times, I'm too this or that. I'm too old, too young. I'm not educated enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not networked enough. Um, just Let's just let go of all of those. Amen? We're going to let go of all the things that say we're not enough. And today we're going to agree with that and just say that's fine because he's more than enough and he loves to do miracles through every day, normal people like you and like me. So I want to begin, I'm talking about Peter, and I want to ask this question. In Acts chapter 3, after Jesus ascends into heaven, Peter's at the gate called Beautiful and there is a crippled man there and he's been there for years, begging at the gates, can't work, relies on the charity of religious pilgrims to give him money. And Peter famously looks down at this man when he asks him for money, and he says, silver and gold have I not, but rise up and walk. And he picks the man up by faith. He's healed through a miracle, and the man goes into the temple running and leaping and praising God. And my question for you this morning is, presumably Jesus went in and out of that temple many times, And if that man had been there for years, it hadn't been that long ago when Jesus walked by him and the man asked him for money or for healing and Jesus did nothing. Why didn't Jesus heal that man? I want you to hold on to that question and put it in your pocket or your purse or whatever you keep things in. In Jesus' day... Every boy wanted to be a rabbi. Rabbis were the most influential, important people in the Jewish community. Jews love, and still today, love the Torah. They love the Torah. They believe that if one generation lost the word of God, that everything would be lost. They believed, that, and they were so honored, to be the family of Abraham to carry the word of God to the whole world, the most important knowledge, how to live a good life. And they did this. They they studied the word. They believed the word. They were people that were full of the word. There's one quote that says, we love to stuff our children with Torah as we stuff an ox. And they did. At five years old, all Jewish children, boys and girls, would begin a school called uh, Bet Sefer, and in this school, they would learn the whole Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. And not only would they learn it, they would memorize it. Memorize it. From five to ten, memorize the Bible. That's crazy. That's like Haven, and you can do it, Haven. I believe you can. Memorize it. Like, just tell me Leviticus 23. What does it say? And so they were so full of the Bible, and the idea was that if someone came, you know, they were always under attack. The Jews have always been attacked since they've ever existed. And and they believed if somebody came and burned every Bible on earth, every Jewish boy and girl could quote it from beginning to end, and it will never, ever be lost. At age 10, the girls would, you know, go to work with their mom. It was the ancient world, and... Some of the, most of the boys would go back to work as well. 
but some of the boys, the really gifted students, would then go on to another level of schooling. And in this schooling, they would study the rest of the Old Testament, including the writings and the prophets and the Proverbs. And they were really good. I mean, they would debate and they would talk. And a lot of these would become the higher level people in the community, oftentimes elders and things like this. But at age 13, all boys would go back to work except for the elite of the elite, the best of the best. And these boys were the ones that thought, maybe, just maybe, I could become a student of the rabbi, a Talmudim. A Talmud is a disciple, and the Talmudim are the disciples, and a disciple is someone who is like an apprentice. It's not just a student. You don't just read books and learn rote knowledge. It would be like if you were a plumber and a master plumber, and you brought some you know, 20-year-old kid, and he began to follow you around, and you're like, okay, you use this tool for this, and this is how you get a hairball out, and this is what you do with, when this is backed up or whatever. <laughs> and by doing what you do, your apprentice would eventually, hopefully, become a master plumber. And in those days, the Talmud, the disciple, was supposed to become just like the rabbi. You see, like today, we have all sorts of denominations and traditions, ways in which we view the Bible. Back then, there were different rabbis who disagreed on things. They had their own unique way of interpreting the Bible and what it meant for Jewish life. And it was so important for them that they wanted their students to teach their yoke. The yoke was their interpretation of Torah, their special teaching, their mantle. And they wanted only the brightest, the best, the smartest, the very, very best to hand their yoke to. And these boys would become Talmud, Talmudim. They would be disciples. They would do what the rabbi does. If the rabbi walks, they would often put their feet in the actual footprints in the dust of the rabbi. Even today, you will see old Orthodox uh, rabbis walking around with young men behind him studying to become rabbis. It was a huge honor. And so after the final school, sometimes these 13-year-old boys would go to find their favorite rabbi in the hopes that they could become a Talmud, a, a, a disciple, an apprentice. And they would be really nervous because asking a rabbi um, to follow him would be like applying to Harvard. You're not likely to get in. They only take the best of the best. And imagine this young teenage boy ascending the mountain to some special Jewish school, and there is a small group of Tommy Deem around a rabbi doing what he's doing, saying what he's saying, learning from him. And the boy would say, I want to be your disciple. And immediately, that rabbi would begin to ask him really difficult questions, and they would go back and forth, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, back and forth. And 99 percent of the time, this rabbi would look down at this teenage boy and he would say, ply your trade. Ply your trade means go do what your dad does. You're not good enough. Go be a carpenter. Go be a fisherman. Go be a mason. Just go do what your dad does. Nice try. Every once in a while, though, one out of a hundred, a young boy would ascend that mountain and he would say, Rabbi, I want to learn from you. I want to follow you. And the rabbi would grill him and question him. And finally, impressed by this young man's intelligence and good looks and everything else, he would say, yes, follow me. And follow me meant you, you had accepted your acceptance letter to Harvard. You're in. You can be like me, follow me, do what I do, say what I say, learn from me. Son, let me tell you something. Your whole life is going to change. You're going to be a rabbi, and you're going to be just like me. You're going to take my yoke upon you, and you're going to carry it on for the next generation. And that boy would enter training to become a rabbi, the most honored man in his community. Wow. Here's Peter. Plying his trade, a young man fishing, fixing his fishing net, sitting on the shore. Today is just like every other day, something snagged and I need to fix this or that. What if Peter was one of those boys who wanted to be a rabbi? What if Peter, a 
ascended the mountain of his favorite rabbi, and the rabbi said, go ply your trade. Get out of my school. There he was, plying his trade, just like his dad, just like his grandpa, just like his great-grandpa, catching fish, peddling fish. And one day, a famous rabbi named Jesus, who's already performed miracles, and he's already a little bit famous, he comes up to Peter, and he says, Peter, follow me. Famous words. Famous words. Peter, I think you're good enough. Peter, I think you're smart enough to do what I do. Peter, follow me, and you will be able to do the things I do, and you'll be able to teach the things I teach. I believe in you. And you ever wonder when you read the Gospels why the disciples, sort of like mindless, are they on drugs? What are, what are they going on here? They just dropped his net and followed him. He just tipped over his you know, tax collector's table and followed him. He just left everything he was doing and didn't say a word to anybody and just started following him. Why? Because they just received the greatest hope of every young Jewish boy. And so here's Peter, maybe 20 years old, and he receives a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to become Talmud. And to become Talmud means to become like the rabbi and to do what the rabbi does. Only problem is this isn't just a rabbi. He's not just a teacher. He starts doing more than just giving good sermons. He starts doing some pretty crazy stuff. And in that tradition... You do what the rabbi does. He heals a guy, you heal a guy. He casts out a demon, you cast out a demon. And you look in Luke chapter 9 and 10, Jesus sends out the 12 and the 72, and he tells them, go out and proclaim the presence of the kingdom of God to anyone who would listen and heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons and don't bring anything with you. Not a sword, not food, not extra clothing. Just leave it all and just go. And they did. And they came back and and he said, well, what happened? And he said, even demons bent the knee to us in your name. We healed the sick. We did many miracles in your name and we proclaimed the kingdom of God. And he said, did you need anything? And they said, not once, Lord. Reminds me of this old mission program, Team Mania. They used to train their missionaries by teaching them to go out for like several days and carry a cross with them and bring nothing. And incredible stories would come of like people helping them in, in their time of need. There's another guy, Keith Wheeler, who tell, tells one of my favorite stories in the middle of some weird, dangerous country like Afghanistan. And he's, he carries a cross around with him everywhere he goes. This is what he's done for like 20 years. He just walks around carrying a cross, talking to anybody who would listen about Jesus and he doesn't have anything. And one day he was like in the middle of a desert walking down a road and he was thirsty and he thought to himself, I want a cactus cooler. You guys know what a cactus cooler is? It's a bubbly pineapple drink. It's really good. Really good. I don't even know where you'd get one anywhere. It's like chocolate soda. It might be out of business. I don't know. And these guys in a pickup truck, they come by and they're like, hey, you want a ride? They're like, hey, you want a ride? He's like, Sure. He hops inside and they go, how about a drink? You look thirsty. We've got some ice cold cactus cooler. <laughs> now, I didn't see that story. It seems a little far-fetched to me, but he says it happened. And I believe it because I have had even more far fetchier things happen to me. <laughs> and that's the way God is. He loves his children and he does weird stuff to show them that they are loved. Like getting them cactus cooler. (laughs) So Peter and the disciples are able to do these great miracles in Jesus' name, and their minds are blown. And now they recognize that being like the rabbi is more than just giving good sermons. It's doing great things. Things they thought were never possible in God's name. And one day, Jesus walks on water. Now this is really crazy. There's a lot that leads up to this. John the Baptist Jesus' cousin, who he's very close to, is executed by Herod. And, and so Jesus, I think, is grieving, and he's in this crowd, and they all want things from him. So he gets on a boat, and he goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to get some, some respite and, and, a, and rest, to grieve, to be alone for a while. And the crowd finds him. 5,000 people find him, and they want to hear from him. So he just begins giving again and 
preaching and teaching. And finally, the disciples say, Lord, you got to send these people away. It's getting late. It's nighttime already. And he says, we're a long way from any town. They're going to be hungry. We need to feed them. And they say, we don't have any food. So he finds a kid with two fish and five loaves. And he turns it into enough food to feed everybody. And then, of course, everybody goes crazy. And he says, all right, you guys get on the boat. You go out on the water. This, this crowd is getting nuts. And I will make sure they go away. And he disperses the crowd. He gets rid of them. And then he goes up the mountain. And he goes to sit up there to spend some time with the Father. And as he's praying, it's getting early in the morning, like five in the morning. And he sees that those 12 that he sent out to get away, they're not able to get back. They're trying to row back to the shore and the waves are pushing them in and the storm is getting rougher and there's winds coming in and they're not able to get back to the shore to where Jesus is. And he sees in there, it's early, like five in the morning, and he decides, I'm gonna save them. Now, imagine being the disciples. You're on a boat and you went out and now a storm is brewing and the waves are so high, they're at the height of the boat and you can't get back. But also in, in, th in this day, water was very, very scary for Jewish people. In an ancient Jewish cosmology, the belief was that there was heaven above and that there was water there. That's where rain comes from. But that's also the throne of God. Then in the middle, it's like, a, like an earth sandwich, okay? In the middle was like land and air where all of us are. And then beneath us was something like hell called Sheol, the world, the underworld, the world of the dead. And this is where like dead spirits and stuff went, a very g weird thing. And they believed that when God created the world in Genesis, that the world was all water, but that God pulled the water back into Sheol so that land could be revealed for people to live on. So this idea that any large bodies of fresh water were the gateway to hell. Like the way you get to Sheol is if you go through fresh water deep enough, you're going to like whoop, pop out on the other side into hell, the land of the dead. More than that, the Bible mentions this, there is this sea monster they call Leviathan. And Leviathan swims in this water. And some Jews believed Leviathan was the devil himself. Others believed it was a demon. It's like this Loch Ness monster type character that everybody talks about. This is all legend, you know, but they believe this, that there's this Leviathan in the water that, and that when the devil gets angry, that the, that's when the waves are like, it's because the devil's getting close. And so, and remember, even though they're fishermen, it's unlikely they swam. Most people couldn't for whatever reason. So you've got these guys on a boat on the water with Jesus who is doing a lot of good and doing things like casting out demons and healing sick. So they're in this whole universe of miracles and now they're away from him. He's, they have no idea where he is they're on the water, it's flushing. They believe this water is the gateway to hell and now the waves are going up and they wonder, is Leviathan near? And they are terrified. They are freaking out because it's five in the morning and they still can't get back to shore. Are you with me still? Yeah. Then what happens? Here comes Jesus walking on the water and they totally lose it. They think he's a ghost or a demon or something weird, and they freak out. And then someone says, no, that's our rabbi. That's our rabbi. And in their minds, what they're seeing is a rabbi not just walking on water. Jesus is walking on hell to save them. He's walking on hell to save them. And there they are, monsters, hell, water, wind, everything. And here comes Christ walking on water to save them through the mist. Here he comes early in the morning. Someone says, it's Jesus. He's here to save us. And what is Peter's first thought? Well, if you're supposed to do what the rabbi does, I guess it's my turn. And so everybody's freaking out. And Peter, the leader, goes, wait, if he can do that, I can do that. He says, Rabbi, you just ask, and I will come out on the water to you. And Jesus says to Peter, come. Peter gets out of that boat, 
And he gets several steps of water, and then uh, something splashes over his head. He's trying to keep a positive attitude. He's getting a little lower. <laughs> the wind goes, woof. Getting a little deeper, but he's trying to keep it together. And he starts to sink. And Jesus reaches up. And we always beat up on Peter, but I always think it's pretty impressive that he, got, he still walked on water. I mean, he did sink, but he walked first. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> I'm going to give Peter a high five when I get to heaven, because I've never walked on water. <laughs> Jesus reaches down, and he grabs his hand. And what does he say to Peter? Do you remember? He says, Peter, why did you doubt? Now think about that question. What is he asking Peter? He's not asking Peter, why did you doubt in general? He's saying, Peter, why did you doubt that you could do what I asked you to do? Everyone says walking on water is impossible. And they're right. Unless I ask you to do it, then it becomes possible. Anything becomes possible if I ask you to do it. Anything becomes possible if I ask you to do it. God doesn't care about our learning and about all the things that we think are so important if we don't have faith. Faith is believing that my life is not limited to what I am currently experiencing. And friends, let me tell you, whatever you come here today and you need a miracle, we serve a God who does miracles. You come here today and you think God has called you to do something great and you see those waves and that wind and you see hell and you see everything coming at you, it's because Jesus is close. It's because the calling is close. Because God is about to get you to the destiny he's called you to. It is so easy to look and say, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. Let go of that today. And be, begin to see a different future for yourself. Begin to think differently than you've always thought. Begin to see something that is possible that is greater than what you ever thought was possible and ask God to ask you to walk out on the water. Ask him to ask you to do something great as Peter did. Lord, ask me. Just ask me and I will do it. And the, the father will say to you, my son, my daughter, do it and do well. In John, Jesus, you know, we think, well, that's Jesus. He does miracles. I mean, that's amazing. But in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things. Everyone says, say greater things. Greater things. Than these, because I am going to the Father. Jesus says in the word of God, you will do greater things than he did. Do you believe it? Yeah. Look, believe the word of God. If you don't believe the word of God, just throw it away. It's good for nothing if you don't believe it. Either believe it or reject it. He says you can do greater things than he did. And I believe it. I believe it. Not only have I seen God heal the sick, not only have I seen God do amazing things, miracles that are absolutely impossible, I've also seen God do even greater things than this through everyday people who thought their life was over, who decided I, my life is not limited to what I'm currently experiencing. I'm going to do something great for God. I'm going to see a brighter future, a brighter present than what I'm currently experiencing. I wrote this in my journal, and I want it to be true for me, and I want it to be true for you. The more you can see, the more you can be. The more you can see it, if you can just see it, Picture it, hold it in your mind, treasure it, write it down, believe in it. Every day, you, you will grow in faith and believe that, in fact, it's possible. Small steps always lead to bigger steps. So you think, I can't you know, build this huge thing, but small steps always get bigger, and that's okay. Baby steps, right? <laughs> Failure is a part of victory. We think that when you pursue something from God. I mean, Peter still sank, right? But it was, all of that was preparing him to fulfill his destiny as Peter, the bishop of Rome, one of the greatest men of God who has ever lived. So I ask you, why didn't Jesus heal the man at the gate called Beautiful then? 
Because that was Peter's job. It was what Peter was called to do. It was Peter's destiny to heal that guy. And there's very often we, we think, well, why doesn't God do this and God do that? And sometimes, not always, sometimes the answer is because it's somebody else's job. And this is one of the most annoying things about God, is that he just doesn't do everything for us, but that he's in partnership with humanity. That he almost always does miracles through people. I don't think I've ever seen a miracle that was, wasn't done through someone else, laying on of hands or praying for someone or, or giving or doing something great. God loves to use his children to usher in his kingdom. And so today I want to encourage you. I want you to begin to see a bigger existence for your life, a better future, and to believe truly that when you're following Jesus, literally nothing is impossible. And to just begin there and to daydream and to wonder and to let go of a lot of the rules that you think apply so strictly to your life and wonder if maybe by faith God could do something great in your life. You see, I believe that the day you have no purpose is the day you die. (laughs) You are alive, you've got a purpose, you've got a calling, but it requires faith. Faith uh, to step out unto hell with Jesus and to walk on it fearlessly. Amen? Amen? And you will. And you will. Amen. Amen. Hi friends, here at Shepherd's Grove and Hour of Power, we are passionate about sharing God's love and dignity with the people in our community, both here in Orange County and all over the world. And we consider you an important part of that community. So today, I hope you'll consider joining our mailing list so we can better encourage you and connect with you. To join our mailing list, please call, write, or go online today. To thank you for joining, we'll send a special bookmark featuring the Creed of the Beloved. We hope it reminds you of how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. Please call, write, or go online today. Hi, friends. We are in a message series on our thoughts and the ways in which we not only limit ourselves but our neighbors by saying negative things like, I'm not smart enough, or that can't happen, or I'm too young or too old. I'm so passionate about helping you focus on your thoughts and connecting with God that I've asked our team to put together these two-sided inspirational thought cards. Yes, everything begins and ends with our thoughts. In our busy, noisy, day-to-day lives, we often don't pay attention to what we're paying attention to. We don't think about what we're thinking about. These cards have positive, uplifting phrases to help you throughout your day. Yeah, that's right. Phrases like, courage begins with a single step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, or a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles, and an extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. During this message series, we will see how the ways in which we've limited ourselves through thinking has gotten us to where we are, and how we can change our thinking to inherit our destiny. Let's change our thoughts and change the world. I encourage you to start each day with Jesus and focus on things that will change your mind for Him. Please call, write, or go online today and request the special six-pack of two-sided inspirational thought cards with quotes from Bobby. We hope these cards remind you how much we love and appreciate having you as part of our community. Thank you, and remember always, God loves you, and so do we.